And I really think that we need to make the most of it because we have got just about two weeks or slightly under now until Lunasa. So for many people, they, they celebrate the 1st of August as basically the very, very beginning of um, autumn. They consider August, September and October to be autumn and then November, December and January to be the depths of winter. And then as you get into sort of February, March time, you're looking at spring. So time to make the most of it, I think. As I'm having a better day today, I'm gonna suggest to my husband, that we maybe go somewhere this evening and actually just enjoy the summer evening because we go to bed quite early and he has to be up early. And so we miss these beautiful summer evenings. And so, yeah, I really think that we all need to make the most of it because the weather has been so atrocious here in the UK, certainly in my part of the UK. So yeah, it's been lovely. It's lovely today. I'm looking out there to like bright blue sky. So Lunasa, what is Lunasa? You might have heard it referred to as Lammas. Um, you might have even heard it referred to as other things. So it falls on the 1st of August. And if you're a pagan, you consider it to be the first of three harvests generally. Some people might think, oh, it's two, but no, it's actually three. So this first harvest, we very much center on celebrating grain and being thankful for grain. When we get to the autumn equinox, which some people call Marbon, then we look at fruit. So it's kind of like a celebration of the fruit that comes. And that is much more sort of centered on Thanksgiving. Both festivals are for Thanksgiving, but I feel like the autumn equinox one is kind of more Thanksgiving because it's this one and this one combined. And then we have the third harvest, which is sowing. Um, and I don't actually, I'm not actually sure whether that's referred why that's referred to as a harvest as well. Perhaps that's more like vegetables. However, I always refer to that in my head as a harvest of souls. And that might well be the reason it's called the third harvest, I don't know. But that's very much how I think of it. Um, vegetable harvests actually go on up until about December, really. This is the interesting thing about the harvest. Like, so I was doing some research on the harvest. Next month, that is going to be our theme over on Patreon. And so I've been deeply immersed in folk customs of the UK and all of this sort of stuff ready for next month. And there was a really, really good point in there that as pagans, we tend to think of the harvest as being you know, Lunasa, the first grain, and then Marbon, the autumn equinox, fruit, and then that's kind of it. But actually, the harvest began back in the middle of June. So the first haze were brought in then. And then there is an absolute abundance of work. It's not just grain, it's not just fruit. The harvest actually runs from middle of June to December traditionally. Now, obviously things were very, very different you know, 100 years ago and beyond. So for example, you know, one of the things that would be harvested and they're still harvested today because we still have them, but is reed for thatched cottages um, and buildings. So back when everyone had a building like that, that would very much be one of the jobs that needed to be done. Hops, um, other building materials, so bracken was used for things. People collected acorns and they were used for feed. And um, I think during the war, they were even used for like making coffee and stuff like that. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done during the harvest. It's not just some crop, you know, for grains and then some fruit. You know, it, there's vegetables and there's all the weeding and all the other jobs that need to be done as well. So the, the actual process of the harvest is year round. And then in terms of bringing things in, that's actually a period of about six months. So I'm very much going into this harvest feeling very, very different about it. Now I've got a little bit more knowledge on it, which makes sense, you know, when you, when you say these things, you're like, well, yeah, of course. But, you know, in terms of being a pagan and looking at the harvest, I think we do forget when we, and, you know, being a pagan for many people is about thinking about what our ancestors did. And we, yet we seem to have this disconnect, you know, we think of the harvest almost as a small thing that just happens over one, one and a half, two months, but no, it was six months, but the the work was obviously all year round. So I feel I feel even more grateful now, you know, when you think about these things. Um, and 
yeah it does make you a bit concerned as well because obviously we've we've built a society that is a certain way and if it all goes wrong then it's going to be a big bump down to the bottom but anyway i thought we could have a look at some of the colors and some of the themes and some of the decorations and things that surround the harvest festival so i was thinking about colors because when i was pondering when i was writing or preparing um for the witching week i was thinking that i very much associate yellow with litha so that's sort of like you know that sun color and then when i think about lunasa slash lamas i very much think about the color orange so a slightly more sort of burnt color if you think i think about the fields i think about the color of the crops and i think about you know the difference in the sunlight and the intensity of the sun and i've decided that you know the main color so this is main colors because obviously there are several colors associated with each festival but yeah for me litha is yellow lunasa is orange and then when i think about marbon i think about like a deep purpley red which i guess is you know those sort of fruits and apples and blackberries and things like that and then when i think about sawin it's very much um like black or gray maybe even a dark gray so what do you think do you have colors that you associate with different festivals you might say purple for for Samhain or for you know if you celebrate that as Halloween um there you know there are lots of differences aren't there between us as people and it very much depends as well on on your landscape and your environment what you were brought up believing but those are my colors and we could go on you know like Beltane I think of green um, in bulk I think of probably white for in bulk um a stara i'll probably go with um like a pale yellow maybe um and then what else what have we missed out you i probably think of that as well there's no escape it's green and red isn't it it's very hard to pin that down to one color red we could say if i had to but yeah um yeah i love pondering these things and i love comparing them to other people's thoughts as well and sentiments because it varies it varies very much from person to person so i was thinking about themes of the festival and again i was trying to do all of this without referring to my grimoire because although i have all this stuff written down and i've obviously been a practicing witch for many many years or a pagan for many many years I think sometimes it's actually really, really good to sit and reflect on the festivals as they come around, because I do find that as you get older, or you could say as you um, become more developed on this path, or you know, you've experienced more, you do get insights sometimes that you perhaps didn't have before. So I always think that's really, really good to just sit and do it without looking at anything. Um, but themes, themes for this time of year. So obviously harvesting, and we're not just talking about food, we're talking about personal growth. We're talking about, you know, you reap as you sow, a saying that we've all heard before, which is so true. I mean, yes, you literally reap what you sow, but there is that, you know, that spiritual, that day-to-day -day life, you reap what you sow. And obviously this is an opportunity to think about what it is we have sown and what it is we are reaping. And the reasons for that, you know, is our own personal harvest how we want it to be? Is everything as we imagined and hoped and desired and worked towards? Or, are, you know, did things go wrong somehow? Did they not quite turn out the way we wanted? What can we do about that? What can we do better? How can we achieve the things that we want to achieve? What seeds do we plant for next year? So this idea of harvesting. Life cycles. So when we look at the old folk song, John Barleycorn, which is the story of barley, um, there is this idea, you know, that he, the ground is prepared, he's planted, there's a period of darkness, he grows, he matures, he's in his full, you know, resplendent beauty, and then he is chopped down, but he comes back that, you know, that cycle of life continues. He comes back to seek his revenge. He comes back as beer. So very, very interesting. Um, and it makes sense, doesn't it, that, that this time of year, we would start to think about life cycles before we proper head into the dark, sort of the darker part of the year and then the dark part of the year, so winter. So harvest, it's all about that idea of bringing in 
the crops, assessing what you have, and then that is going to give you some insight as to some of the trials and tribulations that your that your community would experience, i.e., have we got enough food for winter? Are we going to survive? So yeah, these these life cycles. So again, you know, who are you as a person? Um, what do you need to change? What do you love about yourself? Or who are you going to be in this next turn of the wheel? Are there things that you want to change? You know, you can start again. That's the lovely thing about celebrating the wheel of the year. It just rolls around and round and round. And each Sabbath is an opportunity to basically start again, be reborn. So harvesting, we're thinking of those, those themes that are covered in John Barleycorn. And we think about his death and we think about his um, his treatment and all the in indignities that he suffers. But then we understand at the end of the story that it, it was all for a purpose. So all those life lessons that we learn, about, you know, along the way in our lives, it's, it's all for a reason. Reward. So we're thinking about the fruits of our labour at this time of year. Again, that goes back to reaping what you have sown. So what have you sown? You know, what are you going to be rewarded with? What have you worked hard at? What have you not worked so hard at? What could you have put more effort into? Um, and then as we get closer to March, Carbon, the autumn equinox, then we're thinking about gratitude. So gratitude for those rewards. So when I think about the two pagan harvests, I very much think about Marbon as being the one where we centre on gratitude. And um, I mean, that one's in September, I suppose actual Thanksgiving in the US is in November. But I feel like that part of the year, as it gets darker, as it gets colder, and there will be a very, very much you know, be a difference at the autumn equinox, day and night are going to be the same length, which will be very, very different to where we're at now. We will be thinking about gratitude, gratitude for the blessings over the year, over the summer. And again, it's that taking stock, isn't it, before we head into what would have been, you know, the risky part of the year for communities many, many years ago. And even now it's hard, isn't it, for people with the cost of living emergency, you know, that idea of going into the very difficult part of the year where you might not be able to afford to heat your home and you have to choose between heating and eating. I'm definitely feeling the energy of the wheel of the year much more being in that situation ourselves. So yeah. And then lastly, sacrifice. Um, and there are other themes you could probably think of for Lunasa and heading in towards Marbon. Um, but I'm thinking about the main themes here. So sacrifice. So when we work, when we work at something, so whether that you be working for someone else or working for yourself, I want to say that self-employment counts. I very much um experience i've been self-employed before and i find that people treat you as if you don't have a job when actually in many ways it's harder because you have to seek out the work you have to drum up the work but anyway when we are involved in labor so that might be the labor of the harvest long days working into the night or whether that be in a modern day setting you know you're out at work 40 hours plus a week or you you work from home or, you know, you might be in a job that absolutely takes a lot out of you. You might be an A&E doctor, for example, but usually we have to give something up as a result of that labour. And this is a time to think about all sorts of sacrifices. So John Barleycorn, his life is sacrificed so that the people of his community may eat and may drink. So yeah, this is a time to think about sacrifices. It's a time where we think about the sacrifices that we make that we're happy about, that we need to make. But also this can be a time where we think about the sacrifices that we're making that actually don't work for us. So when I said this, um, I didn't have this when I was planning this, but when I've just said that, immediately the um, um, the two of pentacles springs to mind, you know, that card where he's, he's juggling. Uh, and I think about working smarter rather than harder. I'm thinking about, you know, when you're juggling balls and things are very, very busy and you're doing a magnificent job. But what happens when you drop 
one of those balls or one of those plates. You can look at it as plates, but yes, yeah, sacrifice. Are you sacrificing too much or are you sacrificing what's right? So yeah, a lovely time to think about these scenes. And in a nod to sacrifice, I have to say thank you so much to my patrons, my top supporters who basically allow me to be able to do this as a job to be able to bring this um as a video to you to continue working within the witchcraft community and sharing ideas and sharing information and education because without you guys i would not be able to continue to do that so thank you so much thank you so much i could not do this without you guys so my gratitude to them and to everyone on youtube you know while we're on the subject we'll be talking about gratitude a lot in the witching week over the coming weeks i'm sure as we work through these harvest themes um but yeah thank you so much and if you fancy joining us on patreon come over we have a lovely community we have a very kind and welcoming community where everybody takes care of each other and you will get early access to videos you get exclusive videos and there's a whole other range of benefits so we have spells we have recipes we have community altars we have um, interviews and there's always a mix I'm always trying to keep it fresh we don't have a set schedule each month other than things like the newsletter going out and the printable downloadable grimoire sheets and um, there's always a bit of mix so we won't always have a community altar each month we won't always have a spell each month I keep it fresh and I keep it rolling but you'd be very welcome to join us how are you going to mark lunasa let me know what are your plans have you started planning at all this would usually i suppose about two weeks before would be the point at which that i would start to think about planning what i'm going to do unless it's a major festival lunas is one of those ones for me where um you know i try to do something obviously i try to do something for each of the sabbaths but um, I suppose it falls behind in terms of things like Samhain, Yule, Beltane. Um, I mean, sometimes we just can't do it all. I do very much love the energy of Luna. So, you know, the whole embracing the season and gratitude and, um, you know, that whole reflection on reaping as you've sown. And actually, as a child, I loved the harvest festivals that we had at school. So I don't know what goes on now. It's been a long time since my daughter was at little school, primary school. Um, all of our three children between my husband and I, they've all, you know, they've got into their secondary school now. So I don't think there is as much as um, a sort of focus on things like harvest festivals. And I wonder as well if that's just changed over the years too. But when I was little, Harvest Festival was a really big thing. So we would go over to the church at some point, which would be decorated with wheat and corn and corn dollies and fruits and vegetables. I mean, they would really go for it and we would have a church service and there would be a lot of singing, which I absolutely loved. I loved that whole thing. And looking back now, I could see that I enjoyed that uplift of energy that people singing together brings and um, that was really special that used to you know I could feel that that I loved that so I, I wasn't big on God and um, I didn't grow up in a religious family I did go to a Church of England school so we did always sing about God and there were hymns and there was praying and all of that but it felt very warm and welcoming and safe and joyful um, I was so lucky I went to a small um, I grew up in a large village. Um, we're talking one down on the Surrey Hans border, so we're not talking rural, but it still had that feel about it, um, that kind of country village school about it. So we had a maypole. Um, I danced the maypole, and then many years later, my daughter danced that very same may maypole. So they were quite big on customs and traditions, which I was which looking back, I'm so pleased about, and I was so lucky to have as a child. So we'd go over to the church, it would all be decorated. We'd sing hymns and songs related to gratitude and food. There was a couple of songs that were really, really good. There was one about vegetables, and I can't remember what it was called, but it, we used to sing about um, like uh, cabbages happy and cauliflowers green or something strawberry strawberry sweeter than any you've seen and then it was about like broad beans and it was like like the vegetables were 
kind of like little people, a bit like the Poddington Peas. I'm really showing my age here. I'm sorry if you're not from the UK, none of this will make any sense, but if you are, then it will make sense. But you could always Google Poddington Peas kids cartoon. Uh, yeah, so the, some of the songs used to make me think of some of the cartoons that we watched. And um, we would normally go to an old people's home as well and do some singing. And we would always have to take in some canned food to donate. And quite often that would be distributed amongst the old people at the old people's home. So I can remember giving them baskets individually that had a range of things in. And I can remember them being, or seeming like they were very, very grateful. But looking back, it was probably a load of old shit, to be honest. Sorry to swear. But when you think about like the kind of foodstuffs you got in cans back then which I'm sure probably meant they ate them, but I'm thinking about, you know, like marrow fat peas and stuff like that. Yeah, we used to give them these baskets of canned foods and yeah, it was probably really disappointing for them, but they, they, were, they, they certainly pretended like they were grateful. They were very gracious and I absolutely loved it because you would give a basket over and then you'd normally get a nice cuddle from someone. I was such a soft kid. So yeah, I really love that. And there was usually more singing. So we'd sing for the old people and we'd spend time with them. And I'm sure we had a meal with them. I'm sure we had a harvest meal with them. That was certainly something we used to do at Christmas. And I really loved that sense of communi community. I thought it was great. Now, again, I don't know what form harvest festivals would take, whether that um, is just you take in some cans and then it gets donated to a food bank. But yeah, it, they were happy harvest festivals when I was a kid. And we are talking a very long time ago now. We're talking... 38 years ago so I think they were very very different to the days now and that is a worry isn't it that a lot of our sort of folklore and our customs and the things we do yes okay they're changing and they're changing for the modern person but I think it would be lovely to hang on to what we had because it was it was awesome it was awesome anyway Let's talk about the Lunasa altar now. So this is a lovely time. This is probably one of the best altars to create, I think. Um, Yule is a really nice one. Um, yeah, there are some that are just easier than others, aren't there? This one's brilliant. If you can source some items related to the harvest or the sun, then you can create a really beautiful altar. So I've listed some of the things that you could put on it. You're not gonna be able to get your hands on all of these things. For some of them, the internet will be your friend. And if you're lucky enough to live in a rural community, you might be able to source some of these items. So barley, bread, corn, a corn dolly. So now is a great time to make corn dollies, which um, are all about the spirit of the harvest. That's what they represent. We used to have huge corn dollies back in harvest festivals many moons ago. And also making... Um, a Bridget's Cross or Bridie's Cross for the altar in bulk. This would be the time that you would make it because that that um, that spark of uh, inspiration, but also that spark of light, that energy, that warmth, we're looking at the sun coming back at in bulk. Well, that is the sun that we have at its peak at the moment that has grown our food, that has, you know, tended to the fields so that we may eat. So now is the time to make those ahead of in bulk for the in bulk altar. You could get your hands on a cornucopia. I've been meaning to buy one of these for forever. Um, I will get round to buying one because eventually I'd love to have one on my altar and decorate it with grain and fruit. And um, anything related to Lou, so obviously Lou Nasa, so the Celtic god of the sun, you might be able to find a nice statue or a nice figurine of him online. Anything that's like a disc that's yellow or orange that, you know, obviously represents the sun, grain of any kind, gourds, uh, poppies, anything seasonal, absolutely anything seasonal that you can find outside. Poppies, oh, I just said poppies, um, a sickle or a scythe, that's very, you know, very apt for this time of year because that's how, that's how the harvest was brought in. Sun wheel, sun cross, sun symbols, anything at all related to the sun. Um, a plough, so I don't know if you've got like a little model of a plough. I know many of our grandparents used to have ceramic 
if figurines and, and plows were quite common and wheat so any kind of grain at all obviously makes sense for this time of year.